it's time for another episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my very special guest is Mark David Hall, and we're going to be discussing his book, Did America Have a Christian Founding? Separating Modern Myth from Historical Truth. Mark, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, Mark, this is our first time connecting, and I know you are going to be brand new to a bunch of my viewers and listeners. So let's start our conversation off with a bit of what we might call the Mark David Hall origin story. For those of us meeting you for the very first time at this moment today, what are some of the things we should know about you? Sure. So I'm a professor of politics at George Fox University, which is a Christian college outside of Portland, Oregon. And I've been an academic. I graduated with a PhD from the University of Virginia in 1993. I wrote a doctoral dissertation on the American founder, James Wilson. And I've since done a whole lot of work on the American founding, especially the influences of Christianity in the American founding and religious liberty and church state relations. I published or edited a, a dozen academic books. And my wife kept suggesting to me, you know, Mark, it's great that you've done all these academic books. But so what? What does it mean to the average Christian, the average American Christian? And so in this book, what I attempt to do is is to distill more or less 25 years of scholarly work into a very accessible book, looking at the question, did America have a Christian founding? A question that I answer with a resounding yes. But I also try to draw some applications for Christians and other conservatives in, in America today. And in terms of uh, kind of your area of study or focus, I'm always kind of curious, especially when I talk to academic authors, like what was that uh, that ignition point, that kind of activation point that that sent you down the path of knowing it was uh, kind of your, your lot in life, if you will, to study that intersection of politics and religion? Was it a teacher, a mentor? Uh, what actually opened that up to you? That's a great question. So as a, as a high school student, we lived outside of Washington, D.C. and attended a church um, that had the, the um, I guess he was the president at the time of the Christian Legal Society, a, a religious liberty advocacy group. And I actually was able to intern there as a high school student and then again as a, as a college student. And they do a lot of religious liberty cases. And so I was just convinced as a college student that I should become an attorney and litigate religious liberty and church state cases. Um, all, in my senior year of college, I actually took the LSAT, but then I kind of st- stepped back and in reflecting on my gifts and talents and abilities, I decided that probably the life of, of an academic was better suited for me. So I switched gears and took the GRE and ended up going to graduate school. But I've always had that abiding interest in religious liberty and church state issues. And one of the things I discuss in my book is that the U.S. Supreme Court has made it crystal clear, both liberal justices and conservative justices, that we must interpret the religion clauses of the First Amendment in light of the founders' views. And so although a lot of my work has been what seems to be sort of academic, deep background history, it actually has immediate applications to contemporary religious liberty, church state Debates, questions like, does um, Bladensburg, Maryland need to tear down a World War I era cross on public land? Or does Baron L. Stutzman, the um, florist in Washington State, must she be compelled to participate in a wedding ceremony against what she has sincere religious objections? So history matters for these very contemporary and important issues. And Mark, I understand a, a lecture you gave back in 2010 titled, Did America Have a Christian Founding? is at least part of the origin story for this book. Tell us about that and why that talk struck such a chord with people. Yeah, so that was a lecture at the Heritage Foundation, 2010. And when we showed up to give the lecture, um, my host and I were just pleasantly surprised that C-SPAN had showed up to cover it. And sure enough, they covered it. The Heritage Foundation then published a, a written version of the lecture on their website, And about eight years later, I was pleasantly pleased to learn that it had been downloaded more than 300,000 times. And so I think there is a real interest in these sorts of questions. One of the reasons for this interest is if you read many secular authors and public, I mean, both academic and popular authors, time and time again, you see the same claim. America's founders were deists. They um, created a godless constitution. 
and the the desire the strict separation of church and state. And many American conservatives and Christians just sort of feel intuitively that this is not the case. Now, you do have popular Christian authors out there who challenge that case, and oftentimes what they write is actually quite good and quite accurate, but these folks are pretty easy to dismiss because they don't have academic credentials, and occasionally they make mistakes or overstate their claims, and so it's easy to dismiss these um, Christian popular authors. And so what I think I bring to the table is someone who I'd like to think has impeccable scholarly credentials. As I say, and I don't say this to brag, but just to suggest that I have these credentials. I've published a, a dozen academic books with presses like Oxford and Cambridge and Notre Dame. And so it's real hard to just simply dismiss me as someone who's looking for a usable past or a past he wants to find. And so I make arguments that the, these Christian popular authors like, and yet I make them in such a way that it's very hard for academics and activists to dismiss. Mark, in terms of the academic authors and popular authors kind of pushing the idea that our our founders were deists and, you know, there was this push for a separation of church and state. Uh, you know, for people on the outside, we may not have been aware of some of these arguments maybe as long as you have. But in terms of, uh, you know, those arguments gaining momentum and becoming just more of the popular thing to do, uh, when did you start to see that emerge in terms of the, co- uh, the conversations you're a part of? Yeah, really in the mid-20th century, um, they took flight. In Everson versus the Board of Education, the case that applied the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment to the states, both the majority and the dissent said we must interpret the Establishment Clause specifically in light of the founders' views. Now, the problem with this decision, you know, this sounds like something conservatives would like, but both the majority and the dissent made an argument that goes like this. We must interpret the Establishment Clause in light of the founders' views, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison equal America's founders. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison desired the strict separation of church and state. They desired to build a wall of separation between church and state. Therefore, the Establishment Clause requires this sort of wall. Now, they actually differed as to how Everson should be decided. But then shortly thereafter that, there was a whole host of cases saying you can't have burn public schools, you can't have state funds going to private religious schools, and on and on you go throughout the um, 40s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, now, academics almost right away, some of them started challenging this history. William Rehnquist, a great justice and chief justice, did so on the United States Supreme Court. And I think it's fair to say in the 90s, a bunch of us, not just me, but Daniel Dreisbach and Thomas Kidd and Jeffrey Morrison and others challenged this history. And so nowadays there's a there's a real live debate about whether or not this is good history. And I think many people on the left, many secular progressives sort of get this, which is why a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for instance, um, relatively um, or seldom makes historical arguments because she knows they're bad arguments. And this is just one example. I've just talked about one area of law where this sort of history matters for contemporary public policy. You mentioned earlier that one of the popular ideas or claims is that uh, our founders intended to create a godless constitution. What are some of the ways we can know that that's not actually the case? Well, first of all, let me explain their argument because it's really a lame argument. They point out that the deity is more or less not mentioned in the U.S. Constitution, not to get to the dateline in the year of our Lord, 1787. And that's a pretty weak read to build a case upon. So what I argue is that you can't really understand the influence of Christian ideas on a doc- document like the Declaration of Independence, which references the deity four times, or the Constitution, which references it arguably just once. What we need to talk about instead is influence. What sort of ideas influenced America's founders? And I point to a number that I think clearly had an impact on the men who created and ratified the U.S. Constitution. Let me just mention the one most obvious and important one, and then we can go on to discuss others if you'd like. The American founders believe to a person that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that humans are sinful or self-interested, and therefore we should be very wary of creating a national government with unlimited power, with a plenary grant of power. We should be very wary of giving any one person too much power. And so they created a system of government that involved federalism, separation of powers, checks and balances. Madison says in Federalist 51, if men were angels, government wouldn't be necessary, but men aren't angels, so we need government. And he goes on then to explain the importance of checks and balances, separation of powers, and that sort of thing. Now, on the other side of the the ledger, you have Enlightenment thinkers who at this time were saying, look, men are basically good. 
yeah, you know, they, they act poorly sometimes, but this can be fixed if we just fix the educational system. And what we really need is to take government out of the hands of regular people and to give it to intellectuals, to really smart people with good educations. We should concentrate power in their hands and they could fix things for everyone else. America's founders went in almost exactly the opposite direction, and thank goodness they did. Uh, you know, if you had to try to put yourself into the hearts and minds of the founders, uh, you know, as they were, had kind of that, that forward vision uh, for what they would be creating, what, what sorts of rights do you think they intended to protect or and maybe in terms of the, the scope uh, and, and how, how wide it could be applied? Like, what, what was their original intent? So America's founders, again, to a person, and by to a person, I even include those that were most influenced by the Enlightenment, people like Jefferson, Adams, Madison. But then particularly, if you go down to the, um, the sort of men who were at the Constitutional Convention, the first federal Congress, the state ratification conventions, the state legislatures, to a person, they were convinced that there was such a thing called natural law. God's law for the universe that is applicable at all times and places. We see this referenced in Romans 2. Um, Christian authors, you know, since Augustine, certainly Aquinas, all the reformers embrace this idea. So, for instance, it is always wrong to kill an innocent human being. And the state really can't change that. If the state tomorrow passed a law saying it's okay to kill an innocent human being, it wouldn't be. Now, from this natural law, we derive natural rights, the right to life the right to freely worship God according to dictates of conscience. America's founders embraced these sorts of natural rights, and they believed that one of the first duties of the states are, are to protect these rights. So, for instance, to protect the right to life. Um, James Wilson, one of my favorite justices, a fellow I, I wrote my dissertation on, he went on to sign the Declaration of Independence, helped write the Constitution, an early Supreme Court justice. He gave the first really systematic lecture lectures on law, and when he talks about the right to life, he clearly grounds us in the fact that we are created in the image of God. We are um, God's workmanship. And he goes on to flesh this out. He says, of course, this means that innocent human life from the womb to its natural end must be protected by government. Um, he clearly condemns suicide. He asks a question today when people talk about suicide, proponents often say, whose life is it? Well, Wilson answered, as all serious Christian jurists have answered, it's God's life. And therefore, we cannot take our own lives. That, that, that is simply wrong. We can't do it. So um, the right to life, the right to religious liberty, and on and on we could go. Now, they thought these rights would be protected in different ways by different institutions. And we could talk about this through judges, through the national government, through the state legislature. Obviously, one of the ways they were protected was through the Bill of Rights, which protects the free exercise of religion and other important rights. Now, there are rights in the Bill of Rights that aren't really natural rights. The right to a 12-person jury, for instance. That's a common law right. And yet, ultimately, it's a common law right aimed at protecting important liberties, our right to freely live our lives, our right to life, and so forth. Uh, you mentioned Thomas Jefferson and the separation of church and state. You, you, it's like those, those two things always come up together uh, in conversation. Uh, in terms of Thomas Jefferson's views and related for how we interpret the First Amendment, what's the proper framing? I, I feel like people try to bend and mold and shape that into whatever way seems useful for them at the time. I'm going to answer the question in two different ways. First of all, I have a chapter that looks pretty carefully at both J Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. And I argue that even these two founders who desired a greater separation of church and state than almost any other founders really didn't embrace, at least in their public lives and actions, a wall of separation between church and state. The second answer, though, is that we have to go beyond these two founders. Jefferson played no role in drafting the First Amendment or ratifying the First Amendment. So why we should look to him to interpret the original meaning or original understanding of this amendment is beyond me. When we turn from Jefferson and Madison to the rest of the founders, we see absolutely no evidence that they desired the strict separation of church and state. Let me just tell you one story, then if you want to pursue this further, we can. So literally, two days after Jefferson drafted or finished his letter to the Danbury Baptist, his 1802 letter, where he says, he does clearly say that the, that the Establishment Clause creates a wall of separation between church and state. Literally two days after that, he went to church services in the U.S. Capitol building. Uh, 
where he heard John Leland, the great Baptist itinerant minister, and himself an opponent of establishments preach. Jefferson also allowed the War Department building and the Treasury Department buildings to be used for religious services in the U.S. Capitol. And so i just tell you that, that one small story to suggest that even Jefferson did not act as if the First Amendment created a wall of separation between church and state. And when we turn from Jefferson to the rest of the founders, we see there's just no historical evidence that the founders understood the First Amendment to require a wall of separation between church and state. And in terms of the founders, obviously, one larger than life character is George Washington. So in terms of maybe a litmus test or a good indicator, you know, for our founders thoughts on God and government, what are some of the ways that we can be informed by the life of George Washington? Sure. Let me just make two brief comments. First of all, uh, many academics argue that most of America's founders were deists. To make this argument, they look only at five or six founders, which is problematic as a matter of historical uh, methodology. But Washington is always included as one of, the, one of these deist founders. And yet Washington referenced God's providence more than 500 times, including in private letters and journals and public addresses. Um, he clearly believed, he indisputably believed, that God intervenes in the affairs of men and nations, which of course violates a sort of textbook definition of deism, which says that God created the world and then stepped away from it and doesn't do miracles. So first of all, there's no reason to accept the claim that Washington was a deist. Now he was very private about his um, religious views. So some Christian popular authors have made claims such as he is an evangelical Christian who would worship in a mega church today. And those are just impossible to sustain. But let me move beyond that to tell a second story um, that, that gets to both of these questions. So literally the day after the House of Representatives finalized the wording of what would become the First Amendment, Elias Boudinot, a representative who later become, became president of the American Bible Society, he said, I'm going to paraphrase him, but he said, hey guys, things are going well. Why don't we ask the president to issue a Thanksgiving Day proclamation? Adonis Burke of South Carolina said, we can't do that. That's a European practice. Roger Sherman, the old Puritan from Connecticut, said, no, 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 guys, it's a biblical practice, and therefore it's one we should do. Well, the House agreed with Boudinot and Sherman. The Senate agreed with the House. And George Washington, President Washington, who did not have to do this, issued this wonderfully theologically robust Thanksgiving Day proclamation in 1789. And I would encourage your listeners or viewers to look it up. Just Google George Washington Thanksgiving Day Proclamation 1789. It's wonderful. Um, first of all, he basically says God is the author of everything that's good. Um, he celebrates America, but he also calls America to repent of our national sin. So it's not just a rah-rah, God blesses America in everything we do. I think it's theologically robust, and it shows certainly that George Washington, President Washington, um, it seems clear to me, did not believe that there was a wall of separation between church and state. Surely such a wall would prohibit presidents from encouraging his fellow Americans to pray. Washington, the first federal Congress, saw no objections to these sorts of practices, nor did John Adams, nor did James Madison, nor have most presidents. Thomas Jefferson, it's true, refused to issue formally calls for Thanksgiving or prayer and fasting, but in other contexts, he actually invited Americans to pray with them. So again, I think even Jefferson did not embrace the sort of wall separation of church and state that contemporary groups like the ACLU and Americans United and Freedom From Religion Foundation would have, a, have us embrace today. Let's touch a minute on, on some of the hot button issues, I guess you might say, we see in our news cycle. You know, we see abortion coming up partly because it's an election year. Obviously, there's been a lot of news about the different heartbeat bills that have been passing across the country uh, in discussion related to the death of George Floyd and just all the tension in our country. Slavery is coming up a lot right now. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is a lot of people don't think that our founding fathers spoke into some of these issues like a right to life or slavery, yet there's a lot from our founding fathers that can, can be applied to our modern uh, challenges, issues, if you will, that we're facing. So how, how would, how do our founding fathers speak into some of the issues that are in the news cycle even today? Let me take just one of those issues, because it gives me an excuse to discuss something that was in the draft of my book, but I had to take it out. One objection to my thesis, and of course, overall, I'm arguing that America had a Christian founding insofar as the founders were influenced in a significant way by Christian ideas. Uh, but Mark Galley of Christianity Today, for instance, two years ago wrote a Fourth of July 
op-ed piece where he said, obviously America did not have a Christian founding because the founders did not immediately end slavery. And this is a serious objection that must be taken seriously. I, I think it deserves a couple of comments, a couple of broad comments. First of all, his, slavery, very unfortunately, is something that characterizes all world civilizations pretty much everywhere at every time. Only 5% of the Africans who were stolen from Africa and brought to the New World came to British North America. 95% went to South America and the Caribbean. And so I think it's important to recognize this is not a uniquely American sin. By the time you get to the founding era, many founders were beginning to have sincere, serious problems with slavery. And these came up in, in the Constitutional Convention, and the founders almost to a person were against slavery. And yet you had a few Southern delegates who said this. They said, look, the South will not ratify a constitution that bans slavery. And so the founders in Philadelphia compromised on this question. Now, we could criticize them for compromising. But what was the alternative? Maybe the northern states could have gone their own way and the southern states could have gone their own way. It's hard for me to imagine that would have been better for the slaves. So the Constitution clearly permits, it doesn't ban slavery, but also doesn't require slavery. So something like eight states voluntarily banned slavery or put it on the road to extinction between 1776 and 1804. Now, these are northern states, and slavery was ne never as important to their economies. But still, it, it, I think it shows something, right? They had recognized this was an evil institution that had to be eliminated. There was actually significant opposition to slavery in the South as well. Unfortunately, Eli Whitney came along and invented the cotton gin around 1794, thus making cotton a very valuable commodity and a, a commodity that requires a great deal of slave labor. And so this, I think this provided great economic incentives that kept slavery alive and well in the South. But still, in the 18th century, no one, literally no one argued slavery was a good thing. That didn't come about until the 1830s. 1808, Congress passes, as soon as it can, a law banning the importation of slaves to America. And then, of course, you have the abolitionist movement of the 19th century, which is profoundly a Christian movement. Now, none of this is to excuse the sin of slavery. I think it was a sin. It was wrong. But I think we need to see the whole story and to see that actually many Americans, founders and otherwise, were coming to recognize it was a sin and to oppose it. Of course, slavery was eventually ended, but we still had horrible grim Jim Crow legislation. But who opposed Jim Crow legislation? Well, a variety of people, but most notably, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, the Reverend um, Shuttlesworth, and so forth. And I say that to suggest, again, people who say religion and politics don't mix have to be prepared to throw out the civil rights movement, throw out the abolitionist movement. And I would suggest, actually, a broader view of American history would show that Christianity has been a force for progress and not oppression overall. And we're recording this conversation in the midst of the, well, near, getting close to the fall of what is an election year. So a uh, question for you would be, should concerns for religious liberty infor inform our voting choices as we head to the booth this fall? Absolutely, they should. Unfortunately, in the 1990s, Democrats and Republicans could come together and agree that religious liberty was important. Just look at the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, passed 97 to 3 in the Senate, unanimously in the House, signed into law by President Bill Clinton. In the 21st century, progressives have abandoned religious liberty, at least when it comes to religious traditionalists, uh, people who refuse to participate in abortions or contraception or um, same-sex wedding ceremonies and things like this. The left has completely abandoned religious liberty for, for these, these folks. Um, Donald Trump has strengths and weaknesses, but I have to say his judicial appointments have been excellent. His executive orders protecting religious liberty have been excellent. He is a pro and pro-life justices, as best we can tell. We'll have to see how these cases end up falling out. And so I think, again, we should never be uncritical as Christians of any candidate. And there are reasons to criticize President Trump and, and others running for Congress and whatnot. But I think issues of life and religious liberty must inform our voting decisions as as, as Christians. Again, I, I know people disagree with me, and I'm not saying they aren't good Christians, but from my perspective, Christians should take these issues very, very seriously. Now, we've seen quite a few shifts culturally, politically, even since this book released back in late 2019. If this book were releasing next week, is there anything you'd add or change for a, a new edition, if you will? <laughs> 
You know, I'm pretty happy with this edition. Uh, we're cleaning up, and, and actually a paperback edition will be out very shortly, and I've cleaned up two or three factual errors. Really what I'm looking forward to is the sequel to this volume where I will address um, in a much more robust way things like uh, slavery, I've mentioned before. I'll expand a bit beyond it to talk about the Puritans and then to bring the story of religious liberty and church-state relations to the present day. Um, just to give you a, a brief taste of that, if I'm right about the American founding, that there's no founder who desired such strict separation of church and state, then the logical question is, where did this come from in America? And I'll have a chapter in my um, sequel arguing that really it comes about because of the profound anti-Catholic animus of the late 19th and early 20th century. And here, this is not original. I'm, I'm drawing from Philip Hamburger's great book, The Separation of Church and State, but hopefully bringing that argument to a, a more popular audience. And Mark, in terms of our conversation today, or you know, when people read, did America have a Christian founding? What's the big idea you hope everybody takes away and has heard loud and clear? The big idea is that America's founders were informed by their Christian convictions when they created our constitutional order. Um, so America had a Christian founding, but it was not founded as a Christian nation. And by that, I mean it was not founded as a nation for only Christians, or for Christians, and maybe others would be permitted to be here. America's founders recognized, for instance, that religious liberty is for all. It's for Christians, to be sure, but it's also for Jews, and by extension to Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims and others who have come to America today. And so that's a key distinction. America had a Christian founding, and I'd love people to read my book and take these arguments seriously, but also make sure they don't take the argument too far, because sometimes some Christian um, uh, public voices will say things like Islam is not a religion and Muslims don't have, they shouldn't enjoy religious liberty. It's just false. It's just wrong. America's founders would have disagreed. And I would encourage my fellow conservative Christians to understand that about America's founders. And Mark, for the listeners, the viewers who would like to connect with you, find out more about your books and other resources, where can we connect with you on the web? My wife made a wonderful website for me, markdavidhall.org. It has information about this book, about other books I've, I've published, as well as articles, some of which are available online. So you can just click, click the links and go to those. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Mark and pick up your own copy of this book as well. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Mark David Hall. Once again, our book today was Did America Have a Christian Founding? Separating Modern Myth from Historical Truth. For more on Mark and the book, a great place to start is his website. As he mentioned, you can find that at markdavidhall.org. And Mark, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Sean.